Hey everyone, this is Judith from the Color Authority. Welcome back. And I'm going to be introducing my very first guest of this year, which is Piet Hein Eek, born in the Netherlands in 1967. He graduated from the Academy for Industrial Design in Eindhoven in 1999. While at the Academy, he gained attention for his exam project, Scrap Wood Cupboards. He sold, indeed, all of the cupboards and used the money to start his own design studio back in 1992. The following year, he went into partnership with fellow designer Nob Ruijkhoek, establishing Eek and Ruijkhoek. Today, they continue to work in a 10,000 square meter multipurpose space in Eindhoven, which includes a restaurant, a shop, a gallery, a showroom and a studio. Piet Hein Eek has built his business around old materials, saving discarded pieces of wood and working outside the circuit of mass production. His instantly recognizable work considers the tension between modernity and tradition, waste and sustainability. Piet Hein Eek's work is sold in numerous galleries worldwide. He has exhibited at venues like the Museum of Modern Art in New York, but also Milan Design Week in Italy. Welcome to the Color Authority. How are you today? I'm fine. I'm fine. Doing well. Great. Well, it's uh, just before Christmas and uh, I imagine that you're very busy and it's a very colorful season. I ask all of my people that come onto the podcast, I ask them one first question just as a warm up and that is, what is color? So Pete, what is color to you? Uh, for, <laughs> that's funny. For me, it's a tool. Because uh, or a tool, it's one of the most important ingredients of my profession, and uh, then specifically when it's about interior design. Uh, when I do uh, when I design products, it's mostly that I try to choose materials and textures and colors as close to the design as possible, so that it feels very natural. And with the interiors, I try really. To, uh, it's more like uh, conceptual and more more uh, a way to to even change the whole feeling of, uh, mm-hmm. of the space. Yeah. So you are famous indeed. Your designs are famous all around the world um, for the use of indeed scrap materials. Materials that, as you said, they already have a color because obviously they were used in something else. And then you combine them into your design. So one of my favorites, for example, is the scrap boots um, tall cabinet in green. I'm a big fan of green generally. But what importance does color indeed have in your design? And how do you combine those colors because you're selecting materials based on recyclability or maybe they are already recycled but you have to still combine the colors how how do you do this what's the process behind this uh, that's funny because this is actually what most people see uh, uh, from my products in, in, in real so and and also uh, i think still which is good the furniture the part where I design furniture, which is just one of the things I do in general, is still or and will probably be forever the biggest thing uh, what I'm doing. So most known by the rest of the world, like in that, what do you call it, profession or uh, activity. The, the, of course, the scrap wood collection is quite important. So most people know me before, because of this collection. And actually, this is in, in the furniture, one of the the, the most colorful uh, collections of the complete range of furniture I designed. And the, the, the selecting the colors for the scrap wood is, is not done by the source. I mean with that is that we just buy all scrap wood we can get. Mm-hmm. So the, the colors are just coming from buildings and fences and most of it uh, outside, and, uh, but at least in architecture. So uh, like old ceilings from old houses we get in, uh, floors, uh, paneling, but also yeah, like fences, like I said, outside from wooden homes. So there's a lot of traditional architectural colors in it. From and, the old uh, times. So this can be times. building so from many yeah, years yeah. ago. Yeah, so it's a sort of sort of color range which is dedicated or determined by the formal use of it and also by the tradition in Holland uh, because most of the wood we buy in Holland by the the Dutch traditional way of building and sometimes uh, there were some eras where there was like uh, fashionable colors uh, (laughs) and those come also in because even the 80s and 70s uh, architecture is demolished at this moment so you get 
sometimes strange colors in. So we, we buy all this wood, and this is uh, this is in a, in a, in our wood storage, which is quite big. It's one of the most uh, storytelling parts of the company because we have a big factory with a lot of li- different things we do, and uh, it's not only a factory, but there's a restaurant, gallery, showroom, hotel since a short time. And but the the part where the wood is piled up, which is really big, most people if they come there, they are like, ah, oh, this is the most beautiful thing I've seen. It is, I know, <laughs> I know, because I visit. Well, obviously, I'm I'm Dutch as well. I, I was actually born and raised near near Eindhoven, so I've been many times. It's like a, a fixed stop when I come to the Netherlands to go to uh, to your space, and indeed, the wood space is indeed for me as a as a color designer it's the most intriguing part when you say indeed typical dutch architecture um most of my listeners are not even european what is typical dutch architecture and so what are the colors that people can expect in in your designs automatically especially from the 70s as you said because those buildings are now being demolished happily uh, the 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 current fashion also changes so, so in holland a lot of the buildings and fences are green so we always have a lot of green wood and in the north of holland yeah we we, we call it waterland so below amsterdam yeah. and the and where the where the land is uh, gained by by the sea there's um, a lot of gray and white and and we so we always have gray white natural green and uh, and black is also used a lot uh, for more for farmer purposes and then you have the the what somebody thought was fun so so there's a <laughs> the, there's a brown black green gray natural and other colors and uh, the good thing of the time we're living in now is that green is fashionable and it wasn't at all so <laughs> but we can use green now which so so it's the funny because funny. 10, 10 years ago we, we we were not allowed to use green because no we could use it but we wouldn't sell it and now it's, green is okay so yeah it's fun so me doing color forecast i can tell you green is again upcoming in 2022 2023 more 2023 so then i can imagine that in maybe when things are being demolished again so let's say in another 10 20 years your design will probably be integrated again with green it's funny that indeed this is how you so this is how you get your materials this is how you design because none of your designs are a copy paste they're all singular designs let's say that also because of the material that you use and obviously the color combinations that you make but once you look at your your pile let's call it like that do you do a sampling of putting the colors together just so that you can also create something that colorfully looks looks different or is it uh, more random what we do i call it culture so one of the things in the company of course is that we produce those kinds of those kind of pieces and i'm not involved in each piece myself actually i'm not involved except when there are questions and uh, so most of the colors are determined by the the clients who buy a table and they sort of select looking at former pieces which they like and then the people who uh, do the sales in our company, they're able to make a description which sort of fits the, the demands of the, the client. And then also enough clear for the employees to make a table like that. But it's a very, yeah, it's a, maybe a, a, a sort of joke. It's not a black and white thing. So normally production is a one or a zero. You know, it's like, like this, it should be. And like that, it shouldn't be. But in our case, we have a lot of things to be decided by the employees. And this, uh, we do this uh, in, in a way that, that they are educated in it. They're used to it. And sometimes, of course, it goes wrong. But that's actually really very rare. So almost always we make a table where the client is happy with, like 99% and maybe even more. And actually... It's always not exactly like anybody knew it would be because it, it, it you don't know exactly the colors, you don't know exactly the sizes, you don't know exactly the pattern. But in the end, the table fits in what we agreed uh, together, uh, which is funny because it's the opposite of how the world functions at this moment, that everything should be clear before you st- start production. And in our case, it can't be clear. So it's always an attempt to do what you uh, agree to. 
But that's a surprise factor. And I think there is a, an audience for that. And I think the world is a little bit changing. People are slowly letting go of control. So also control on design processes, manufacturing processes. Obviously, you got way ahead of the masses. You were already focusing on sustainable materials and recycling, which is yeah, making what it already is into something new. What role indeed, um, or actually what, what we would say, role does color play in future sustainable interiors? Because that's just what you say, the customer. So there's a part of personalization. They do get to choose a little bit pattern and color. But do you think there's been a change over the past couple of years? And where do you think this future of interiors is going because of the claim on sustainability that your brand has, but many others now finally are following? Yes, the, the, this subject is, I, I think, quite difficult because it's, um, if, you, if you look at our brand, then the change, the most dramatic change is that we sell more and more expensive pieces, mm-hmm. uh, which I didn't want to, but it, it happens. And of course, when you sell an expensive piece, it's less likely that, it's been, that it will be thrown away in a short time. So it makes it more sustainable. The other aspect, of course, and that's why everybody thinks or puts me in this sustainable frame, they frame me in a sustainable thing, is that it's recycled material. And a lot of my designs are made of leftovers from our own production process or from other production processes. And a lot of my designs are without leftovers. So with new materials, but zero waste. And that's not because I wanted to to do to improve the environment as a goal on itself. It's just because I don't like to throw away, and I like to be um, efficient with materials and energy also. And if you turn it around, this is actually quite an economical thought because if you produce in in the Netherlands or in Europe, and you where labor is already so expensive, actually because of the cost price of labor it sometimes doesn't matter to throw away material because it's out of, out of um, there's no balance in it. You know, mm-hmm. if, if the costs of labor are very high, it doesn't matter if you are respect, if you have respect for material. You know, if you throw half of it away, it's just a small part of your cost price. So who bothers? But happily, uh, sources become more expensive. So it becomes one of the major themes in our uh, economy. And I think for most designers, this always always has been an important theme, trying to be as efficient as possible with the materials. And in my case, it's also the craft and the, and the whole process from ID until consumer. And I think for me, the sustainable part is that and you mentioned it, but I think it needs to have a little bit more uh, explanation. The, for me, the most important part of uh, the sustainable thought is that I create my designs with what's available around me. Mm-hmm. So the, the sources, the materials, the, the machines and the craft, and also our clients, because we, have, we, worked, we collaborate with our dealers, most of them, for the, we start and we never end. So we have a very solid way of working uh, in which we don't lose a lot of energy in, in, in general. So it's, it's different from recycling because that's just a part of it. But yeah. I believe that, uh, that if, you, if you use what's around you, instead of think about something and then try to get it, you know, if I make a design, it's always done with what's available around me. And if I would make a design in general and then have to see where the materials and the technique and the crafts come from, you are transporting and losing a lot of energy in general. And so for me, this is the most important thing in my business case, in terms of uh, sustainability. Yeah, so local sourcing and trying to reduce the, the footprint of, of your designs. Indeed, yeah, I think sustainability, indeed, it's a very big name. It's um, used a lot in marketing currently, but it's it's a huge topic. I, I do think, indeed, that although you're not initially putting yourself in that frame, it is indeed what you're what you're well known for, indeed. And as I said, you got there very early using waste. Um, I also saw one of your last interviews in which you de-romanticized design as you have a very pragmatic approach in a very transparent manner. Um, you, you have a very transparent brand. You are, I think, also a very transparent person. We as Dutch are known to be, as we say, we are rooted. We are down to earth. You know, How did your Dutch upbringing 
influence your career? And how do you keep the, um, I call it, you know, living in, in Italy, I call it my Dutchness. How do you keep that Dutchness standing, you know, steady on both feet in with all the fame that you're in the end, you are gaining, whether you like it or not? Yeah, well, the the last part is, I think, for me the most clear part. I, I don't, uh, I don't feel like that. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like like uh, it's everyday work with my feet in the ground, and I try to be uh, in that sense. And it's actually, in my case, it's true because the successes we have are always uh, going hand in hand with a lot of problems because we produce ourselves. We have. Uh, I always invest in new plants, and they never work immediately. So it takes a lot of time and effort to uh, to actually make it happen and make it successful. And that this is also something of the, the world where we're living at now is that we, a lot of young people, but actually everybody is looking at, at successes of our people around us as if this is the, the norm, as, as if this is normal. And we live in the internet time in which uh, very few people people get extremely rich by just one ID and then almost in an instant of a moment. But in history and also in current history, people who are successful or achieving something did try, did work quite a lot for it. So the normal procedure is that you work your whole life and then you die and you reached something, you know, like a certain wealth or a certain success or I don't know how to describe it, but the differences are, are quite small, actually. And, but we compare ourselves to the enormous uh, successes of a few. So what's normal in our world as a, as a goal or as, a, as where you compare yourself to is actually not normal at all. It's not, yeah. So, so we, we sort of lose a, a realistic eye on what's normal. And we instead of that, we think it's normal to be rich in one day. And, and then we also think we get happy if we are rich in one day, which is not true either. So, so no. for me, we're, we're sort of living uh, in that sense, in a, in a, in a strange way of uh, everybody knows it, but it's, it's, uh, I think almost nobody is realistic in this. No, we're all following that crowd on, you know, it's the, um, I call it the, the, in, the world of Instagram, the world of Facebook. We're all following those very successful people. And we all think that it takes literally nothing to get where 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 they've they've come because the suffering and the mistakes the many mistakes just like you said when I have a plan almost never it it for a hundred percent goes into uh, full production or it becomes success because you have to make many mistakes right for for things to actually yeah. become a yeah. success then in the Dutch we have a very I, I love that phrase do ma normal dan doe je gek genoeg um, act <laughs> Act normal because that already is crazy enough, and I think that's a very well capture of of Dutch upbringing. You know, and um, just act normal, do your thing, but you know, keep it low. Yeah, mm -hmm. true. <laughs> Dutch design has also been upcoming since many many years. I mean, me living in Milan since already thirteen years. Milan Design Week, obviously, it's still very very important. But I see that Dutch Design Week over the last couple of years, it's been really upcoming. It's bringing forward a lot of talents. One of you, obviously, um, are you yourself, but how would you generally describe typical Dutch design? Just in a few sentences, what is typical Dutch design for you? Well, I've been quarreling about this subject also for a while because the typical Dutch design was promoted by Droog Design uh, since uh, well, like 20 years ago, maybe even 30 years ago until now. Now it's less, but... And they wanted to point out like D Dutch design and they called it Droog because that was the brand uh, which sort of describes like uh, a fundamental and conceptual basic way of thinking of design, which was actually uh, quite happening at that moment because in the 90s where the oil dollars came in, there was so much wealth and growing wealth that, the, that if you did something like... Uh, very simple it was a total contrast with what everybody was doing so the 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 simple solutions of the dutch designers were very much appreciated as in contrast with the with the enormous wealth and and uh, sort of luxurious designs the rest of the world was making and then we got the the, the twin tower so everybody was confused and uh, and uh, no money but the total panic and then again the simple 
and and the basic way of thinking of Dutch designer was very very much appreciated. So we had two two moments in the last twenty years where Dutch design, because of its uh, character and the, the the way of thinking, was appreciated. But it's also a sort of coincidence that that those things happened because the Dutch designers are like they are. And all of a sudden, there were two two eras of or two decades of uh, of reason to to uh, to be appreciated. And in general, if you look at the Dutch designers now, I think there's a huge differences. There are huge differences between the designers. So I don't mm. think I think it's not honest to a lot of those designers if you frame them as Dutch designer because mm. they should be regarded or respected for their individual qualities and i'm one of the most dutch designers actually <laughs> but not because of those last two decades but more if you compare to the the architectural and design tradition in holland i think a lot of my designs fit very well in 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 a dutch way of designing and thinking yeah. much more yeah. than uh, than this than this last more fashionable approach to this phenomenon so you and the, you recently celebrated eleventh your eleventh anniversary of your space a space that used to be an old Philips factory. How important are those those roots for you, and what role did Eindhoven indeed play in your life? Because you say it's merely Dutch design that fits well here, but you are exporting all over the world. But what always with Eindhoven as your base? So how important has that been for you? Well, that's a very practical importancy. Uh, because uh, when I graduated in Eindhoven, everybody left town because there was nothing to do here. Mm-hmm. At least it was not sexy. You know, there was no uh, no cultural life. There was nothing to do. Uh, all all people who were creative left town. So it was it was really boring city. Uh, only producing uh, like like Philips, like uh, and Duff, and uh, so the city was not creative at all. And also creative people didn't like to live here. But I liked it here because it was possible to ha- have a space very cheap. In the beginning, it did, I didn't pay anything. So that was mm-hmm. good. Uh, so there was there was literally space to have the factory. In. And there was a, a mentality of uh, production. So a lot of people in this area, they are used to produce. So the, the mentality is, uh, is uh, nine to five working. And not talking or or anything else. And in, uh, for example, Amsterdam, people are talking a lot. They make money with making money, and they are you know bankers, lawyers. Uh, so it's much more about communication and money than uh, in this area where there's much more production and people, yeah, physically working and a lot of technique. Actually, the the technicians are also here. There's and craftsmanship then, as well, right? There's a lot of yeah, craftsmanship, craftsmanship in uh, en- Engineers, the biggest density of engineers maybe in the world even. I don't know, but there's a, it's competitive with the American uh, hotspots. Mm. So there's a, a huge amount of high, high educated uh, uh, technical employees because of ASML actually, and but also because of the other production uh, companies and also because of Brainport and uh, and uh, the Philips, Philips also invested uh, when they left uh, Eindhoven with the headquarters, they invested in the how do you call it the research part in Eindhoven. So, so there's a lot of crazy engineers here. Uh, and and the other thing which was important for me at that time, and it still is, is that because there is a, a, an economy based uh, for, on production, so like uh, manufacturers and producers, there's also a lot of suppliers. So in the end, if you want to make something, you're better off here than in most other parts of Holland, uh, for sure. Mm-hmm. Actually, this is the best place. So that's why I stayed here. And in the meanwhile, the place became more sexy. So it so now it's, now it's nice to stay here. It so is, the, yeah. the big disadvantage uh, turned out to be, uh, to also became an advantage. So now people stay here. There's a lot of creative people. And most of the creative people who are here, who are here actually are also very much involved in production or produce their own ideas. So it has a certain character in that sense, which is quite nice. Yeah. You just said that Eindhoven, at least, you know, let's say 10, 20 years ago, was not that sexy, was maybe also not very inspirational. Yet you, you've been there all along. But where do you get your inspiration? Um, so generally, your design inspiration, but maybe also for, for colors that you may want to use. Where do you get that inspiration? Well, it's a little bit what I described earlier. So right from the beginning until now, the my way of working has been uh, unchanged 
only the circumstances changed. And which means that I design with what's available around me. So the materials which we can buy or which we can find in terms of scrap wood, it's more that what you get is what you get. Mm -hmm. The biggest inspiration is, is the materials and the machines we have and so on. So, so it's very practical. And then, for example, now we made a hotel and then you need a hook. And then I, and normally I... I often try to buy something and then I think now it's shit. So I make it myself. And then in the end, I make everything myself. And then we have a whole collection, but it's just because I think yeah, I don't like it or I, I think it can be better. And then, so you make your own hook and your own toilet paper holder and your own everything. You know, so, sink. <laughs> so in the end, the projects and what we do and also the projects for clients, yeah, they sort of inspire or demand for something new and that's what i make then after that indeed you just mentioned uh indeed you've i mean you've i was researching you obviously i mean i've known you for for many years i've known your brand for many years being also born in, in brabant but you've gone well beyond being an interior designer you have a restaurant um that even allows indeed the takeaway of the very typical dutch tasty fried kitchen not very famous in the world, but it's something that I miss personally in Milan. You've been very involved in architecture with many different projects in the Netherlands. Then, of course, there's your beautiful space in Eindhoven with an art gallery. You even have your own hotel. Not to forget, you have holiday homes in France. When I was just researching, I was like, an hour is never going to be sufficient. But the world of Piet Hein Eek, indeed, seems endless. It, it really seems endless. But you have a very strong brand an image that I imagine requires maintenance. You have to maintain what is what does it mean to, to be Piet Hein Eek and what, what does that design mean? How do you keep sure that you keep in line with your image and how do you source collaborations outside the Netherlands or with different companies, for example? Oh, there's a lot of questions. I always try, if it's about the communication, which is actually not so easy, but I always say we only communicate what we do or what we create so if it's a restaurant we communicate the food we make or we communicate what we made because we made our own restaurant and now we're going to rebuild the restaurant we have made then we have two <laughs> but uh, so the, the the general rule is we only communicate the creative production part nothing else because it's enough it's what we do and if we start communicating even more it's too much because it, you know in general what we do is too much to communicate. It's uh, it's one of the problems of our company. Mm -hmm. It's that uh, that you can't actually understand what we're doing if you've not been here or if you didn't read a lot about what we do. <laughs> this is this is also nice. It's also something which takes you know this, like I said previous. If you want to, if you want people to understand at once what you do, you have to keep the message very simple. But if you have a very complicated or a, a full message, you need time. So that's so we grow in, with the time. But the what people know about us and how how much they understand takes even more time. Uh, even uh, though we communicate a lot, it's it's just impossible to to understand what what we're doing. Yeah. And uh, so the, the the rule is to communicate what we're doing and making. That's that's one rule. And it's also very difficult to, uh, at this moment, at this specific moment, also because of Corona, because of all the measures which are coming, coming and going all the time, it's it's more difficult to uh, to make a strategy or to, you know, you have to change all the time what you're doing because uh, it's not allowed, or at least you have to. Especially to, for your restaurants right now, uh, right? Uh, yeah. At this moment, at this moment, that's the biggest problem: the hotel and the restaurant. But it takes a lot of energy to change that. And uh, actually, at this moment, we're quite in a process of uh, getting even more each part of the company done by somebody who's uh, responsible. So that, that sounds crazy, but uh, that's a little bit my policy that everything should be done by somebody else except the designs. I make the designs, but it's not so easy to arrange that. So, so we're at this moment in that process. Yeah. So it requires a lot of teamwork and, and people that you trust, good collaborations among the people that you work with, a lot of, of faith, of course, in, 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 uh, in everybody. 
One of your last projects, which I obviously, as a color designer, enjoyed very much, is the Pete Hein Egg Off the Charge, which is a color range that celebrates your 30 years of work. So colors also apply to your recently opened hotel. How did this project come about? Can you explain a little bit how you created these, these colors? Yeah, that's a simple, simple. So if they could, because I was uh, talking with my uh, girlfriend, Stephanie, who is very good in colors from Rennes, and we were talking about the hotel. And uh, I actually was inspired by Baragan, who's uh, a Mexican architect. And, uh, my favorite, Luis Baragan, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and he has a time fellow. Uh, I think it's called Legoretti or Legoretta, something like that. Legoretta. Yeah. And um, so I, I like the work of both uh, architects a lot. I think it's very, very modern, although they're both died. They both died already a long time, but it could have been made now. And their colors are often uh, beyond what you would choose uh, as an educated designer, because it's, uh, it's... As an educated uh, Dutch designer. Uh, yeah, but even international, you don't see that much extreme colors uh, in architecture. And specifically not combined, like, what, what, why do you combine this? And then it's always nice and beautiful. And, and they are actually able to make the weirdest colors together and that it feels really natural. And that's, of course, what I aim with my work, that, that what I do can be maybe extreme, but in the end, it should feel like it's, it's a natural thing. That's most of the time the goal I have. So I, was, I always have been inspired a lot by by them and for the hotel we have the bathrooms and uh, you're only only just like uh, you're only taking a bath in the bathroom or a shower and that's it so you can actually use uh, extreme colors and i wanted to do something special there that each time when people come into the hotel and they go into the bathroom they they'll have like a strange experience you know something like oh <laughs> that's nice so we started thinking about uh, co combining colors and we already were working with the paint company, Luck. So we, we thought maybe it's nice to make a, a new color scheme and brand and that we use all our colors uh, from the past because I, I used colors right from the first projects like 30 yeah. years ago until now. Uh, but sort of accumulating into this last bathroom <laughs> project of the hotel. And we actually, I always use quite strong colors in my projects. I think that's, again, something perhaps more traditional than you, you would think, because in the past colors, uh, there were much more colors used in, uh, in interiors. And, and just after the Second World War, it became more and more white and gray and uh, uh, less colorful. And a lot of the old scrap wood actually we have are from interiors, which were painted in, uh, in nice colors, uh, although those were uh, very recognizable old-fashioned Dutch colors, but still more color than we use now. So I think it's not something new, uh, not at all, but it's nice to, to, to reintroduce. And also, uh, for me, it was nice to show that if you do an extreme color and you put it in a room, it doesn't feel extreme. It, no, it, it feels it, it, you can do almost everything without being punished. So, so it was also for me like like showing the world uh, and our guests that they are free to use colors as they like, and that it's uh, it's uh, it's rewarding and not uh, you're not being punished by it. Yeah, it's. I think it's true. So one of the reasons why I started this podcast a couple of months ago is because people are afraid of color and they don't understand color especially in, in spaces, they tend to think that let's go safe, let's go gray, let's go white, let's go with neutrals. And, you know, but unfortunately, those neutrals always don't always do something for you. Now, you just mentioned Paragan. Um, I am a big Mexico fan. Uh, I've worked a lot with Mex Mexican architects, Mexican designers. I went twice this year and I went to visit the Casa Guilardi and it was just... I think it was, I was struck by how indeed Mexicans use color. And I think it is a big learning curve. So it's, um, it's fascinating to hear that, that this was also one, one of your main, main inspirations as, a, yeah. as, as both being Dutch, being inspired by, by the single country of, of Mexico and, and their architects. How did you, because when I look at your, your color range, you already even indicated different applications 
So this palette can be used for maybe exterior. This palette can be used for products. That is also something that I have to say, not a lot of paint companies or designers actually do. Um, is that your way of helping people also to use color in their house to, to maybe not make them so afraid of using color in their homes? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it, we, we just took our color, the, the colors we used until now, and we, we framed them in the, in the purpose we used. So like for objects, are the furniture and objects we made, interior and exterior. So we had, we, when we sort of inventorized everything, we had like a few groups. So we thought, let's add that to the, mm -hmm. to the, to the color because then it's clear where we used it for. It doesn't mean actually that you can't use it for something else, but at least it, it indicates where uh, where it's useful. And, and if you look in our books, for example, I don't think it reflects to that, but uh, we have uh, three books, with uh, which is like a chronological overview of all the work we've done, mm -hmm. um, which is, uh, they're, they're huge the books, so we do a lot of work. But the projects with the colors are actually in it. And often you see on the drawing... Uh, like a green and it's the green yeah. from, from our color scheme so that's that's fun yeah it relates indeed to indeed your your 30 years of uh of career as uh, working in color indeed you've always been uh, very present at milan design week for many years with a very steady presence at uh, Lo Spazio di Rosanna Orlandi. Uh, it seems that Italy also is close close to your heart. Um, just how important has Milan Design Week been in your career? How did you see this last edition in September? Did you did you come to, to Milan? Yeah, we were there. We were at Rosanna. And yeah. uh, I thought it was very positive because it was just after uh, things were, were allowed again, after one, one and a half year or something. And I heard a lot of negative Oh no, not a lot of. I heard negative uh, reporting about it because it was not as massive as it was normally, and so on. But we felt it because I was there with Nat as a very positive thing because it it showed that life can go on. So so it was a a, a positive thing by itself. And in the end, uh, it's it's also about in the end uh, about who's coming and and it's not the mass, but uh, the specific people who are uh, whether or not they're good or bad. But we we got the impression that we still had nice contacts and. Uh, But of course, it was less crowded. Maybe that's even the future, but I don't think so, actually. But but it was really very good that it was there uh, yeah. because because it it it, it, well, it should go on. So. Yeah. How long have you been uh, exhibiting at Milan Design Week? It's been quite a few years, right? I think 2006 or seven was the first year, I think. Right, yeah, that's that's many years. Yeah, I personally loved this Milan Design Week because it was not so crowded. You could go places. Yeah. I didn't have thousands of people in my pictures, you know, trying to yeah. wait, make a picture of a design. And people were just, you could just sit down at especially Rosanna's uh, place and just have a a glass of wine without, you know, finding a seat. It was just, I felt it was more comfortable. And I, I thought quality actually was there. I, th I thought quality was there. Maybe even even more so, but that could be due to the fact that we were stuck in our homes for two years and everything seems more beautiful when you finally get out of your house as well. So you are doing a lot of stuff. You're doing a lot of projects. It, it seems endless, your world. But what do you dream about? What's next for you? What would be a dream that you would be happy to accomplish soon in the future? Well, we just go on with constructing uh, on the plans. So now in the coming year, next Dutch Design Week, we'll have like uh, the restaurant completely new, probably before the summer already. Mm -hmm. And like nine new atelier studios we're going to rent. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I have enough to do. And after that, we're going to do the station, which is in front of the restaurant to make it a gallery. And of course, we need money for that. So there's enough to do in general. And apart from that, we, uh, of course, we have to, to keep all the other things uh, up and running. So the hotel has to start actually still. And now it's closed sort of because of uh, the, it's not possible to have dinner now. So that's, mm -hmm. well, that kills uh, everything. But uh, so we have a task to get this functioning in a way we hoped it would be and in general i always say if i die and i, I i've been every day happy uh working at the place i i have been then it's good so that's uh, until now it's uh, quite successful because i always love to be here so, yeah. so for me it's good and i like to continue it like like it is 
You just answer one of my last questions. What does it mean to be successful to you? Um, so you just said, you know, it, it is that when when I'm not here anymore, that I've I've had a happy life and I've enjoyed doing what I do. You, however, also make a lot of other people happy because on your work floor, there's a lot of people with limitations to, let's say, the work floor or workspace, which are maybe typical Dutch projects. But you are somebody who who uses your your empathy. To, to help out others as well. And I think this is one of the play, this, the things that I enjoy most when, when I come to your spaces, that, that you also work a lot with other people who are maybe less fortunate. Is that also part of, of your, let's say, you, who you are as a person or, or as a brand? Uh, I don't know. I, I think you've seen the social, social label uh, yes. projects, yeah. So that's a friend of mine. And actually the project was not existing when they asked me to do something for a presentation or a sort of festival they had. And there was a social workshop there. And then uh, they needed an interior for that. And I I thought I designed it very simple uh, because uh, they didn't have budget because of the festival was sort of social festival. And in the end, it came out that the people from the, the social workplace were actually, so they were, well, uh, well, in Holland, we say they have a distance from the labor market. So they are not easily to implement in uh, as a normal uh, entry. And they were actually able to make this furniture. So we found out that at that moment, that it might be nice to co- combine design with those people because you might create a brand which sells products uh, made by people who have a distance to the labor market. And um, this was the start of social label. And before that, I actually did like two or three or four, actually many projects in the same way. In Africa, I did a project. I did a project in Portugal. We did often uh, in Adom, where I was born. We did a project like that. So I'm very willing, if people have a, a question for this, to to help with my specific quality, which is designing in the end. You know, I do a lot. But in the end, the, the most specific quality I have uh, in comparison to others is the designs I make. Yeah. So and so when it's social, I'm most of the time very willing to do it uh, also for nothing or for I don't mind actually. I just like it. So so that has been right from the start something I do regularly. But actually, it's not that successful as you think it is because the sales are always a problem. So uh, we had very nice projects. The Mm -hmm. best one was actually one in Africa. A church came to me with a project over there, which they financed with people who were disabled by the war. So missing an arm or leg or really, really, uh, really disabled. And they wanted to help those people to, to make a living. And they had the idea, because they also have like a tea room and a shop in Harlem, you had the idea to make to produce over there and sell it here. Mm-hmm. So I made a, a series of designs inspired by what I thought African people would like to make. And uh, so, in my opinion, typical African uh, furniture, but also Dutch and easy to make. And then uh, a guy went there and he helped the production, which was also a nice story because this was an old friend of mine, by coincidence involved in this project. And then after the first batch, we found out that the transport was so expensive because it was not a, yeah. a, it was in the heart of Africa and not on the shore. So transporting the the, the furniture to the harbor was was so expensive that it was not it didn't make sense to actually import it to Europe in a regular base. So we did one project. And then one or two years later, we found out that uh, those people were actually making these products for the local market <laughs> and, making, <laughs> and making a living with it. So this was the best result you could have. So, so in the end, it was successful, totally different than we thought it would be, and not with our money and not because we bought a lot, but just because we gave them the skills and the possibility to, uh, to make furniture, which is actually a better result. It is. To me, it sounds successful. Maybe it's not what you initially planned. But it is a beautiful philanthropic project. And in the end, it is helping people locally. Yeah. 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 But that's also coincidence. The only thing is that I, 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 what I know for myself is that people have this kind of, because the problem normally with anything you want is to sort of 
mobilize energy you know you need yeah. people to do do something because you can't do a, a, everything yourself so if you have a plan or an idea or you, you want to do something then you need somebody who is involved and uh, and enthusiastic and, uh, and really wanting to do it and most of the time with this kind of projects people come to you who have this energy so yeah. that this makes it more nicer to work with it's a good goal but you also have the most important ingredient of a project it's somebody who really wants to achieve something so then uh, then it's more easy and nice <laughs> because yeah. if everybody has the same goal it's much 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 more easy to uh, to work yeah well i hope that maybe people listening to this podcast can can come up with either or, i don't know you never know what happens solutions or uh, maybe new projects um i do think that indeed just generally what you're doing with you know using no leftover materials so hardly using any waste i think that definitely something that um, a lot of designers are looking into and i think the next step is that corporates are going to start looking into that uh, and then of course the philanthropic aspect of, of some of the projects that you do I, I think it's just just beautiful that you do so. And with this, so, so I wanted to thank you for being part of the Color Authority podcast for, for your time. And um, you. obviously at this time, I'm wishing you happy holidays as well. Thank you. The same. Nice holidays. Thanks. So this was Judith Van Vliet from the Color Authority. Thank you for listening again to yet another episode. If you haven't done so, please go to Apple Podcasts, subscribe, review and send us feedback on this episode. And I hope that you will be listening to the next episode coming out very, very soon. Thank you and have an amazing, colorful day.